Good morning, United. Man, if my mother had sang like that before dinner, <laughs> I might have ran to the table. <laughs> we are inviting people to come to the table, and I'm sure in your lifetime you have sat at all kinds of tables, and many have been tables of joy and maybe not so joyous. But in our lifetime, we find ourselves at tables. And during this Advent season, our church is reaching out to you from our heart, inviting you to this table. And today, at this table, we are focusing on joy for our third Sunday of Advent. So it's good to be with you all again. It's good to be in this space and finding creative ways to invite each other to tables. There should be a table on your screen now, and earlier today we heard a family inviting us to another kind of table, and so we are seeing each other in different ways. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you uh, for another year. Um, in a couple more weeks, we will say goodbye to 2020, but uh, Lord, this has been a year uh, like none other. Um, this year has outdone itself. Uh, and Lord, you have taken us through this year. And so now focus our, our minds and our hearts on your word. Focus our hearts and minds on this message and help to fuel our journey, inspire our journey, and keep us together as a community of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Today for part three of Being Called to the Table, um, the subtitle is The Spirit is on Me. The Spirit is on Me. Watching kids in the art of play pulls one into joy. Kids who are enamored in the moment lose themselves quite willingly and seem to be transported to another world. Play allows children to use their creativity while developing their imagination, dexterity, and physical, cognitive, and emotional strength. Play is important to healthy brain development. It is through play that children at a very early age engage and interact with the world around them. Remember one of my friends said one day her daughter was beating the doll so bad she had to rethink how she disciplined her child. Play tells us a lot about how kids are thinking and how they're beginning to process and engage their world. Visit any playground or visit any park or show up at a school just when it releases the children from grammar school and you will often see kids who have never met some time running and playing and having the time of their lives. There is something happening in these spaces. I would like to think of it as joy. And one does not have to go looking for it, but joy finds these kids and tickles them, and it points them, so much so, to so much fun that when they go home, often they have earned themselves a bath. Kids are so important to us because they remind us of the importance of enjoying ourselves, of taking a break, of laughing. Shirley Caesar, a renowned gospel artist, shares that her and her siblings were playing. They loved to play. And because they were steeped in the church, they loved to play church. Some people like to play house. <laughs> Some people like to play school. But her and her siblings, they loved to play church. And when they would decide that they were going to play church, they would assign different roles. Somebody got to be the pastor, and somebody got to be the singer, and somebody got to be the deacon, and somebody got to be the usher. But after the roles were assigned, they would engage in this play, and they would really get into it. And it was really serious business. So one day, they were playing church. And they got the music going, and the service was going, and Shirley began to dance. And she was swaying, and she was shouting, and she was jumping around. And at some point, her siblings thought, she's gone a little too far with this now. We we're just playing a little bit of church, but she's gone too far. And so they called out to their sister, but she just kept on dancing. 
And then they went and got their mom and said, Mom, Shir Shirley is messing around out here. And so the mom came to the door and looked outside and said, Shirley is not playing. Shirley has got the Holy Spirit. Now, I imagine Shirley wasn't looking for the Holy Spirit, but sure enough, the Spirit found her. God's Spirit finds the prophets, too. God's Spirit finds Isaiah. Most prophets were minding their own business when God finds them and lets them know, this is what I want you to tell the people. Really? Really, you want me to tell the people that? Right up front, the very first words tell us that the Spirit finds the prophet, and they are sent. On this particular occasion, the prophet declares that God is sending him to mission in the world. It is to bring good news to the marginalized and oppressed, like we carry a gift that we've purchased for someone. But this is not our gift to give. We give it on behalf of God by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If we attend to the words of Isaiah's mission, we know also that that is Christ's mission, and therefore it is our mission. We recognize that the mission itself is simple, but it's not easy. They invite us to turn our gaze on the other, to turn our gaze outward, and to notice the condition of other people. Last week, the text was written to the people in captivity, but today the text is written to a group of people who are liberated and are free. Last week, we learned that bench pressing faith was hard work. Exercising our faith is hard work, but the spirit is there and the spirit is here. The Spirit sends us to be with those who often are most vulnerable and challenged and going through hard times. The Spirit sends us to share good news in the world. All kinds of folks have been sent by the Spirit, amen? Mother Teresa left home at 18 years old, never to look back. But even at 12, she felt this call of sending on her life. And when she left home at 18 years old, she would never see her biological family ever again. She felt sent, and off to India she went. And at first, Mother Teresa taught in the schools, but that didn't feel like enough. Mother Teresa says she felt sent to live and work among the poor. And so she took classes, medical care classes, and she learned more information, and it was hard. At different points in her life, Mother Teresa had a crisis in her faith, but the Spirit remained on her to do the work. How do you do what Mother Teresa did without being sent by the Spirit of God? She is not the only one that's felt sent by the Spirit. Frank Critchlow was a native of Trinidad, and he migrated to England in 1953. Frank was an artist, and he was just a good, solid man. He's not political. He was not outspoken. He didn't want to be in the limelight at all. He was like so many of us, just ordinary people trying to earn a living and trying to just have a little bit of joy in our lives. But Frank got the idea that he would have a restaurant, and he opened up this restaurant, and Frank could cook, and he would make this good food, and it was spicy food. And when he opened his doors, the people came. And what was discovered was that the people in his community had been looking for a space to gather. And so people came and they ate and they congregated and they felt affirmed in this space. Well, the people weren't the only ones that noticed Frank's restaurant, so did the police. And they began to raid Frank week after week to the point where almost people were afraid to come in the restaurant. Now, before he had known that he didn't want to be a leader of any great movement at all, but here it was thrusted in Frank's lap, so much so that people were like, you are our leader. They began to protest against the police and ended up in court. And Frank didn't want any of it, but the spirit found Frank too and orchestrated events that would lead 
to them being in court and receiving national attention. Frank got sent too. The Spirit was on him. Many times when the Spirit is looking for us, we're not too excited about the Spirit finding us or even the Spirit sending us. I shamefully confess that my six-month-old puppy has only been shampooed once by me. I don't know why they're laughing. <laughs> now I'll tell you, I imagine that he is carrying unknown germs that have strengthened my immune system. <laughs> but I also must confess, I remember the one time that we tried to shampoo the little guy. We got them all lathered up good, and little did I know how hard it was to get all of that soap out of him. And to say that he was not a willing participant, well, that's an understatement. Boy, oh boy, this was a job for three people, but there were only two people. He squirmed and he did everything to try and free himself. So the next time he went to PetSmart and I went shopping. But that incident reminds me of humans a little. Remember Moses? Moses wasn't so willing when, when God was trying to send him. Remember Jonah? Jonah wasn't too willing when God was trying to send him. And I imagine for us, we aren't too willing when the Spirit tries to send us. It seems like sometimes Christians squirm under this real call to do mission in the world. But it doesn't stop the Spirit from trying to locate us and send us to. What is God inviting us to do? What are you squirming about? Have you drifted from God's call and sending because you were afraid or doubted like Moses that God could use you? Like your ancestors, do you feel inadequate for the sending? And yet, you are exactly who God wants to call. God sends God's spirit to everyday people like Frank and Mother Teresa and Moses and you. What is left on your bucket list of things to do that would bring you joy? What is in you that has not been allowed to be free? What do you still need to do? Don't forget about joy. And if you're confused about where to find joy and how to locate joy, just put your eyes on the nearest kid. They will point you in the right direction. They even consider it a full-time occupation. Today, we are being invited to play. Today's table, today's invitation is a table of joy. Christmas is getting closer and closer, and we can feel the anticipation growing in us. It's okay to turn on the music station now, even though they've been playing for a month already. Pull out the music in your Advent kits. We put some Christmas music in your Advent kits. Pull that music out and start singing. This week on the screen, you should see a table. And this table was given to us by our musician, Joe Wilkerson. You probably know him as a music director, but he also can decorate his buns off. <laughs> and he knows how to have a party. And so here's a table decorated with people being invited and food being served and joy in the midst. I imagine they might have played a little bit too. He's got a sense of humor as well. Around tables all over the world is hope and faith. And yet today we talk about the table of joy. Invite someone to this table of joy. Invite others to spaces where they can take a load off their shoulders. There's nothing to it like coming to a beautifully decorated table and having some food and breaking bread. Now I want you to use your imaginations. I don't mean this literally, but there are all kinds of ways that we can invite each other to tables, that we can invite people to tables of joy, that we can experience community together. Last month for Thanksgiving, this church gathered together and we experienced joy as we shared our stories with one another, as we checked in. And I dare say that we were around a table. 
So today we began talking about Advent, reflecting on Advent, Advent, talking about play as important business. When's the last time you all played? I right, say I got a few of them here. When's the last time you all played? Okay, Joe last night. Okay. The rest of them are a little stiff. Okay, so I am sending you guys to have a little bit of play. One of the things I enjoyed about Open Breakfast here, which is a ministry of serving breakfast, is that we often play. We didn't just work, but we played with one another and we made jokes. We worked hard, but we also played hard and we laughed. But our kitchen has been closed for nine months. It's been nine months. Where might God's spirit be sending us now? This week, we will assemble 30 lunches, something new for us, but something we did a long time ago to send to the night ministry, to send to the night ministry, which gives out food to people who are on these streets. If you're interested, we're probably going to get asked to do it for the month of January. And if you're interested in making bag lunches, we invite you to be a part of that. But where might God's spirit be sending us? Surely God doesn't expect us to just sit in our homes until COVID is over and do nothing. We don't have all the answers. But isn't it exciting to know that God is not done with us? That God still wants to send God's spirit on us? And don't be surprised if the Spirit finds you. And try not to squirm. Imagine the Spirit overtaking you as you hear these words written by the prophet today. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. God has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And just maybe, maybe others will look up at us and say, wow, they are not playing. The Spirit really is on them. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for Advent in this time of reflection, in this time of pausing, in this time of slowing down, in this time of waiting. We thank you for these seasons. We know that Christmas will come but we want to savor the moment of what it means to send a little baby into a cold world. We thank you that you give us joy and that it is here in good times and not so good times. Lord, we thank you that you have invited us to a table and we thank you that we can play even when we are adults. So let us play and let us laugh and let us extend invitations to tables and let us anticipate that the Spirit, the Spirit will find us and send us on our way. Amen.